Thank you very much for joining us on Sky TV. Tonight, I have a guest who is a young man. He's hardworking, he's full of ideas, and he loves innovation to the extent that he is the reason why private broadcasting emerged in the Western and Central regions. He's probably not a man we should call a guest on this program because his office is right here inside Sky House, the chief executive of Sky Group of Companies, Wilson Arthur. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Arthur, for joining us. And uh, nice having you. Well, so your name is just Wilson Arthur? Yeah, and I was born on Tuesday, so I'm called Kwabina. And which part of Ghana do you come from? Western region. Western region is very huge, from Sefirioso area down to Sekindi Takradi and into... Uh, I was born at Ateku. Yeah. Ateku is uh, very close to Chufufraso. My wife says that if your town, <laughs> if where you are born is near another place, you have to describe the place by saying via. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then you are a bushman, so <laughs> you could call me a bushman. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't look like a bushman, you look very regal. Uh, handsome and uh, very civilized. Thank you, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what kind of person is Kwabena Wilson Atta? Very average. Um, I see myself as an average guy. Yeah. Um, I believe the difference. Um, the difference is that maybe I'm focused, I know what I want, and I try and go for what I want. Are you able to stand somewhere and watch your own self and, and ask yourself, who is this man? I don't really do that. I, I don't have that opportunity. There's you, you always too much <laughs> pressure on you to stop and even wonder what you're doing. Well, um, your, your employers um, know you're often under pressure. When did you start having pressure in your life? Right after school, um, after university, yeah. Um, after, after university, I did my national service at Ukajakrum in the Volta region. It was after the national service that I decided that I was going to be on my own, you know. Um, but obviously you need some experience, so um, the decision, that decision to go on my own came with all that pressure. It, you definitely have to go through a lot of hassle. Why, why did you decide you were going to be on your own? Because your contemporaries and perhaps even today will have to work for government in some office and put on a tie like you have now and sit in some air-conditioned office. Why, why did you want to be on your own? I wanted to be a medical doctor. You? Yes. I read biology at A-level, you know. I went to Kulibu. I saw <laughs> dead bodies, cops. And, <laughs> and it scared you? It scared me out of, you know, reading medicine. So I decided that um, I will go into you know, a profession that will make me, you know, free. That will make me uh, bring out the best in me. And um, I love the entertainment. So I realized the only way out was to go on, on my own, you know. Um, it's, it's not been easy, though. You love entertainment. Yeah. Do you love money, too? Um, no, I first love the service. Money is a result. So you love that result? Yeah, yeah. I get, if you get results, if you offer good service, the result is money. Well, so l l let's uh, come back to your very beginning or genesis, if you like. How did you grow up? I grew up um, among a lot of children, you know, among a lot of siblings, I should say. Um, we were 10 in number. I was in number seven, okay. Um, my mom was very enterprising. My dad was a retired military man, you know. What's his rank? Um, he was a captain, army captain, yeah. Um, it's, my mom, my dad died quite early. I think I was around eight years when my dad, we lost my dad. 
So my mom had to take care of all of us, you know, and she was so strong that, you know, we all, uh, we all got involved in our family business. Which was? Trading. What are you trading? What were you trading? My mom trades in everything from barrels, um, empty barrels, you know, to clothing, anything that people will buy. Did she make a lot of money to look after you? Yes, she did. Yeah, so we she had a very comfortable life. She's a rich woman? She's not a rich woman, but you never know that she, she, she wasn't a rich woman. When we were young, we thought her mom was very rich because she could afford anything to the extent of, you know, sending my elder brother to um, overseas to study. So you learned something from your mother, obviously? Yeah. What? That money is a result. I got that from my mom. I got that from my mom. Um, my mom was very caring, you know. I remember the, um, what she does is, if somebody comes to our home and the person gives you money, my mom is like, give the money to me. My mom didn't want us to handle money at our early ages. She would take the money and then she would tell you that, I'm going to help you make money out of this money. So she invests the money in one of the things she's selling. So you see your money growing. And that is a big lesson um, I had when I was a child. I realized that if you put money into something, it grows and then you can get money out of that and, and then you can have whatever you want from the profit, you know. So you learned how to make money from your mother? Yeah. And interestingly, she was, she is stuck illiterate. Didn't, she didn't go to school? No. And she sent you to school? Yeah. <laughs> Which school? Uh, I started at Atiku LA Primary School. You know, then I left at class five to Tishi Estate Preparatory School. My elder sister was then at Math Literary Academy and Training School. So I moved to Accra and I joined Tishi Estate Preparatory School at stage four. And the following year, I was promoted to go and read the common entrance. So I was jumped one year, you know. And it was very interesting when I when I went to TEFS. It was some few weeks to the uh, test. We were 25 in class. When the results came, I was 17. And the, I remember a class teacher came to the class one day, and after announcing the results, he asked. Ha, we will have to move three of you to go and join the class five people to six, six to go and run the common entrance. How, um, who, will, who thinks will pass? You know, this, we were going to write a test. Who thinks will, will go through? And I raised my hand. He gave me a knock. <laughs> Put your hand down, you almost last. <laughs> and we want the three best people, you think you are one of them. That was the day I decided that I was going to be one of them. And when we wrote the test, I was first. You were? Yeah, he couldn't believe so it. So in the end, you were not an average student? Um, yes, I wasn't an average student, no. I think I had, when I came to St. John's, I had the highest common entrance mark. St. John's in second D? Yeah, when we came to St. John's. What do you remember of St. John's? I was very young when I came to St. John's. Um, what age? I was 12. 12 years? Yeah. And those times, there were a lot of 13s and 14s, you know. Um, so when you are, and I was tiny, you know, so I remember it was a lot of hassle. I didn't know anybody in second year really. You know, so it was a lot of hassle. You always have to be on your weight to survive. But I enjoyed my school days. I enjoyed my seniors days. I had more fun than <laughs> really learning, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. And I didn't ask how old you are now. Hey. <laughs> Do you want to know that? Perfectly. The viewers want to know, would uh, like to know. Uh, I was born 66. 1966. And that's the year Nkrumah was overthrown. Mm -hmm. So you didn't get to know Nkrumah. I heard, I heard about it. You heard yeah. of him. Okay, so coming back to school, why is it you enjoyed your St. John's days? How, why is it you enjoyed it? Why? Um, 
there was a lot of entertainment in those days, you know. Um, the brothers were there, the whites, you know, and St. John's was um, a premium school, you know. The fact that you are St. John's, you attract a lot of respect and attention, you know. The school band was there, entertainment was very solid. And, and you were a dancer? Yeah, yeah. How well did you <laughs> dance? Um, I think beyond, um, when we got, I was Krifi, I was an SU, you know, very activist, very active in the SU, you know. So um, my dancing skills was kept under covers till I got to Form 3. Form 3, my godfather left the school, so I was free, you know. So I started dancing beyond Form 3. You know, that was when the slide, um, backsliding, I get to so what the dancing competition. And the Michael Jacksons. Yeah, those stuff were on, and I was, I was a serious big dancer. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to ask the producer, so we take off these, uh -huh. um, so we can create a stage for you uh -huh. to try some <laughs> dance for us. Uh, would you that be you okay? don't need to take off this table. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we'll do that after this program so we can infuse it. Um, so um, then you left St. John's and went to the university. Yeah. Uh, what did you go to read in the university? University of Ghana? Uh, no, I left St. John's um, O level and went to St. Aquinas uh -huh. um, to do my sixth form. Because I, like I told you, I, I really hustled. So I wanted to be very close to home. So, you know, my. We and Accra was and oh well, Accra was close to home, so okay. Um, I, was, I did my sixth form at St. Thomas Aquinas Secondary School. Yeah. And then went on to? Then went on to Legon. Studied what? Agri-economics. So what has agriculture got to do with your life now? Nothing? Except the food you eat? No, agriculture, economics, it's, it's, it's basically economics. Yeah, it's basically economics, but um, the focus is on agriculture, you know. And yeah, I've learned so much from it. I'm practicing a lot of stuff from it. Tell me about some of your classmates, because if you've become this relevant in society, um, one would expect same of some of your classmates. Do you remember some of them? Yeah, I remember a lot of them. I remember my best friend, Mackenzie. He's at Cocoa Board. Um, Eduardo. Um, uh, host of them, Ken is with the World Bank now, you know, World Bank office in Accra. Uh, but a lot of them are out of the country. And you've forgotten a lot of them too? Yeah, I've forgotten a lot of them. And Three of them are actually lecturers now on campus. I see. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you were a vandal yes, on I was campus? Yes, I a vandal. How did you end up as a vandal? Did you choose it? No. At Commonwealth, everybody is a vandal. When you come to the University of Ghana and you land at Commonwealth Hall, you're a vandal. Even so a pastor who comes to Commonwealth is a vandal. So you're a vandal? Yes, I'm very proud you're of that. You're a bad that. boy? No, vandal doesn't mean bad. Vandal doesn't mean bad. They do bad things? No, not necessarily. Good things? Yes. What are the good things they do? Um, somebody will just come to your room and it's like, hey, do you have sugar? You know, it's like, we, you can, you can. The solidarity. Yeah, 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 that's solidarity. And we are, you are your neighbor's keeper. It's beautiful. Uh, was Nata, when you were in school, did you ever think of the media as, um, as a sector you want to venture into? No. No. When did you first consider being in the media? When I was in the UK, um, Tala Fata visited London and met a group of young Ghanaian boys, you know, who were in UK. And he broke the news to us that the National Communication Authority is um, giving out licenses for private radio stations now. Must be 94, 95? Um, early, yeah, around 93. 90, yeah, 94, 94, yeah. 94, 95, yeah. yeah. And when we heard it, it was like, wow, why don't we, you know, come together and try and set up a radio station? So myself, my cook. The Robert, owner of Vibe, yeah, Vibe Robert FM. Yeah, Robert Tamaklo. 
you know, Robert comes from typewriter, and they were all typewriter guys. My cook was at GSTS. Yes. You know, they were my seniors though, so I didn't really know them when they were here. But when we got to London, then you got to know that I'm a senior boy, and they were GSTS yes boys. We became friends, you know. So we decided we came together to create Vibe FM. You know, um, the name came up. The beleaguered Vibe. FM. Yeah, they are still on. Uh, um, the name came up at Lewisham College. We were researching into technology, what to do, where to buy equipment, still, stuff like that. But eventually, um, my job was such that I couldn't just leave, you know. So um, my cook and Robert came down, and they got a license, and they decided that after all, they didn't really need uh, any third partner, so they went alone. So you didn't go with them. I didn't get an opportunity. Otherwise, you would have been with them. Yeah, I would have been with them. I see. But when I came down, mm -hmm. they were very helpful. And you were selling CDs in Accra? Yeah. Before? I sold CDs because of Vibe. When I came, I had a lot of music in London. So when I came down, I was like, um, either you buy my music or I rent it to you. And they said you rent. So I set up a shop and I was renting CDs to Vibe plus any other station who is interested and joy. Um, was it a successful grew. business? It was a successful business. Um, I think my breakthrough came from a young man called Quantus. You know, um, should I describe him as a young man? He is a big guy, actually a big guy called Quantus. He walked into Akainzu, Quantus Akainzu. Um, those who are really into the show business, Kale. He's very powerful. So when did, when did you meet your wife, Ajoa Mofa? On campus. Oh, so uh, I was how? in my second year. She yeah. came in first year. And then uh, she, she came was to an our innocent home. girl. Yeah. And then yeah. as a vandal, you did what? Oh, she came to a party at Commonwealth. <laughs> then I, you know my dancing skills. I was dancing and um, she dances very well. So we were like, oh, you know. So we danced a few times and then um, I took her room number and started visiting her. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you start loving her? Oh, Philip, <laughs> you're getting too personal now, aren't you? <laughs> when did I start loving Ajwa? I think the first day I, she was, she made me very relaxed. I mean, I enjoyed her company and I intended to keep that relationship and it worked. Okay. So then one day you decided you were going to do radio. Yeah. When I came down from London, I started renting CDs to my friends. I got a job at Media Number no. One as marketing manager. Very exciting, very challenging. It gave me a lot of contacts, which I'm using now. I got to know everybody who matters in the um, advertising industry, you know. And I did a lot of creative things. I did a lot of work with media number one. Um, basically, we took it out from there. Um, I took Vibes license and just turned around a few things. I mean, I took their proposal to get a license, turned around a few things and I applied, and eventually I got a license. What kind of faith did you have in radio, particularly in deciding to come to uh, poor, poor territory in Takradi? Um, Philip, when I went to the NCA, I, I first went to the NCA to find out the opportunities. Um, and I met a young man who is now one of their senior officers called Brock. He advised me that, young man, um, do you know Takrady? I said, oh yes, yeah, I lived in Takrady for some time, I know Takrady. Then he said, that is where I believe um, it will be easy to get a license to go to because People are rushing for a cry in Kumasi. Nobody is coming from Takrade. You know, and apparently they had given a line to somebody who thought Takrade was so worth it. Yeah, he didn't really take it. Um, he didn't really take it. So I said, I'll try. So they gave me the, the um, provisional frequency. So I came down. I came to Takrade. I studied the terrain. And uh, my ad hoc research told me that it's an interesting market. You know, I, my background is marketing. You know, so I realized at least there was a huge need. I said that the people were not advertising. You know, um, 
and people were not really into radio. People were not really, really listening to radio. Like there was Twin City Radio then. There was GBC Radio, yeah, yeah. But you know, and then you and then, <laughs> and then um, we started looking for partners because I didn't have enough money to start a radio station. How much money did you have? I had 15,000 pounds of my own money, you know. And then, uh, so we started looking for a partner and the license then was 10 million. 10 million was a lot of money, you know. So um, I contacted my elder brother to partner us to do the radio, myself and my wife. Kennedy Atta. Kennedy Atta. He agreed, declined, and then agreed, you know. So eventually, he agreed to disagree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ken, that is good. Ken came in. You know. How about your wife? What kind of support did she lend? Did she think it was a useful venture at all? One, the money was in UK. This fifteen thousand pounds, and I was in Ghana. She was in UK. And this was six, seven, eight years ago. Eight years ago. Now to get her to bring the money down, you know, it needed a lot of convincing. But I got my wife, I spoke to her on the phone at length. I got her to agree to send the money down. And then we noticed that when Ken said he wasn't interested, we realized that we needed money. We had just a day to the deadline that the license would have expired. So I called my wife, she transferred the money through a friend, you know, some commission had to go off the money. But she had to take a bank loan. But fortunately, she was credible. She was in a very good job. So she could just walk to a bank and take a loan. The decision was taken a day. So she got a loan. The next day, we had the money in Ghana. I paid, secured the license. Then fortunately, my brother also had a change of heart. He came and um, we accepted. You are listening to the genesis of Sky Group of Companies from the best man, the man who is most qualified to tell us, Wilson Arthur, the chief executive who started it all and who still works at Sky like a normal employee. When we come back, we'll get deeper into his brain and we'll see the actual operating system at Sky Power FM, the pressures of being chief executive of this most successful company. When we come back. Nasuka one more rescue. The moon dream in Nara, and then you will drag stores at Papa or Mimi. Poku Farmer, why there is a yen in Niazi? Welcome back, and still with the man who runs the multi billion CD industry, Sky Group of Companies, born in the bushes of Ateku the same year Nkrumah died, 1966. A gentleman. Mr. Wilson Arthur, so did you think you were going to be running a multi-billion CD industry back in 1997, October 5, when Sky was launched? Um, did I know? I, I was, yes, I hoped. I aimed at it and we been working towards it, yeah. So I don't know if I should but say you, that. You didn't dream, did you, that you were going to be sitting as um, the manager of this huge building, all these gadgets and all these people, uh, dozens of them? Philip, um, it was a dream. It was a dream. It was something we've been working towards. It was a dream. But building, putting up this building was not something that many people thought was possible, including your own senior brother. Yes, yeah, they, you, you are right. You are right. Um, we've been lucky. Yeah, we've been lucky. Um, the people of Sekeni, Takra, the Western and Central region accepted us as a brand, Sky, you know. And I believe that we have 
done what it takes. We have done what it takes. So what was the vision? The vision was, originally the vision was to become the leading radio station. Yeah. And I knew that if we have the attention and my marketing background, my advertising background helped us to sell the attention, you know. So yes, you, have, you could have a radio station with a lot of attention, with a lot of people listening to them, but they will not be making money. How possible? Because you have to sell the attention. Look, um, I remember when Woodin was setting up here, they came to my office, you know. You remember that tiny room with the transmitter? 3700 yeah. You, you were the sitting, library beside yeah. me, you know. And, they, and they, someone they, advised that you shouldn't be sitting in front of a transmitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Woodin came to your Woodin office? came. The young man came to my office and he was, you know, he was like, um, we are uh, opening up a new showroom here. Um, we want to get everybody's attention. How can you deliver that? So I just looked around me. I saw a newspaper there, a sports paper, and it said that Aikote was fighting that weekend. So I told him, sponsor Aikote's fight. Then he said, how? The fight is in the U.S. And I said, yes, we'll run radio commentary. How? I said, yes, we'll use DSTV. We have DSTV service. We'll watch the fight on TV and run radio commentary. I said, but it's not been done before. That was it. That is Sky. We don't do the norms. I want attention. Anything that I will do that can deliver the results is what we do. So how do you get the ideas? For example, at that moment, you just saw a newspaper. You didn't plan. It's in desire. There. Desire to to um, give your client results. When you have desire, when you genuinely want to satisfy your client, you begin to dream, think. You begin to look, and when you look, you find. And then it was radio and then TV, television. Yeah. That yeah. When did that occur to you? We've always wanted to do television. Um, after, the, after the first two years, it became very clear that we have good cash flow. Um, everything was fine. We had, we had a passion. You know, we had staff like you who had passion, you know. And it takes a lot of that to be successful. So we decided that we want to go into TV. So we applied for a TV um, license some five years ago. That's how far ago we tried. So it. that was the year 2000? Yeah, and we, we, it was, no, it wasn't, yeah, it was even beyond 2000, about six years ago. But we didn't get it. We were told that, forget it. You're not going to give in a license. Uh, did you know what it would have, it would take to run a TV station before you dreamt of it and applied for it? A license. I didn't know, but I have the benefit of radio. And when I was at Media Number One, you know, we had airtime on GTV. So we were producing Smash TV, TV market, you know, to feed our airtime. So I knew, I, you know, I had some experience. I shot a lot of TV commercials for Peak Milk, for Azar, for Latest Home, you know. So I had, I had some experience, yes. I had some experience in production, you know, in scripts, in the creative side of the business. Yeah, but um, I didn't know what it takes to manage a, a TV station, no. But, you know, the books are there, so you can always read. And the, um, like you know, I'm going for a TV management course now. You well, know. so that's an announcement. <laughs> He's going to be going to the United States, a mm -hmm. uh, couple of states to study. Yeah. Um, for how long? Three weeks. Three weeks, okay. And uh, that's in April, right? Yeah. Um, so what are the challenges in running this industry? Uh, of course, the TV is new, barely six months, half a year old. What's the challenge in running the broadcast industry? You are dealing with talent. And talents like footballers, like musicians, um, the attitudes are very difficult to handle. You have people who are stars who go out and they are pampered. They have big egos, you know. You have to manage and get the best out of all these people. They are 
people who are very difficult to manage. Um, How do you get around it? Um, I get to their level. And what's their level? I eat with them. I flow with them. I jam with them. You know, so they see they see me. You see me more or less like a colleague. Yeah, you're able to pour your heart out. You're able to tell me what you want to tell me. And after that, life goes on. So it's deliberate the way you are. Yes, you, I, you, I'll have to understand you. You know, I'll have to know what you really go through. So, um, yes, you know, occasionally I get very firm, you know, and then I ease up. And then life goes on. See, um, at the end of the day, Nobody is perfect. I have a conviction that everybody here is special. There's, I mean, everybody here has a beautiful heart. At least that's one of the things I look at for when I'm employing. So how come you fail to keep some of the stars? Joe Innocent, Park of Fee, uh, the endless, the names. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ephira, literally. Yes. Um, just like Myself, everybody has ambitions. You know, everybody has um, their own personal visions. You know, um, like you know, I communicate very well. The vision, if you share in the vision, you stay with us. If you think you have outgrown the vision, or if you think, uh, f so I think some of them left because some of them secretly I knew. Um, they were scared they would lose it. They think they've hit the peak, you know, and there was nothing more they could do. You understand me? And uh, it's very sad to be at the peak. And if you're not able to invent yourself, you know, reinvent yourself, you sit at the top and before you are where you are down Did there. you ever saw some of the stars you manage or still are managing? Have you seen a lot of them hit their peak? Yeah, we have a few who have hit their peak. Don't, what? don't ask me to mention names. <laughs> well, I, uh, <laughs> thankfully, I'm not going to ask Good. you, but what then becomes the indicators of, of stars that have hit their peaks and perhaps um, these people will learn to recognize it elsewhere? Um, see, our job, if, if you're in the media industry, yeah, you have to realize that you're as good as your last performance. You're as good as your last performance. You know, nobody remembers all the good things you did in the past. All they remember is the few days, what you did. So you have to, you, as much as you want people to stay tuned to you, you also have to stay tuned to the people. The moment you get to the top and you stop listening to the people you stop you know you stop tuned into people you stop going out with them finding out what their needs are the moment you stop you know living up to their expectation you are losing it you are a star yourself am i i'm telling you you're a star what makes me a star because you are this you are the manager of these stars have you hit your peak Maybe um, there are times that I've felt very still, but I always come up with excuses like, oh, it's been over four years, I've not gone on leave, so maybe I'm tired. I take a weekend off and then I come back. Um, I won't say I've hit my peak because I believe there's so much. Currently, if you ask me, we are seriously performing below our capacity. We can do far better than what we are doing. How about the departments, the various departments in-house? Uh, how difficult is it to manage, aside the people? What we did initially was um, we didn't come up with rigid structures like you find in the civil service. This is my area, that is that person's area. You know, yes, we had people responsible for various areas, but we realized that somebody in the newsroom could be doing programming, could be doing something else, you know. So we've always lived in that, you know, um, in that smooth running operation, you know, um, way. That's how we work 
the systems here. Informal? Um, it, it's yeah, semi-informal. Semi-informal. We, as the company has been growing, now it's become necessary for us to set up um, some form of radio structures in some areas, but it's becoming very tricky. It's because legendary. When you do that, yeah. when you become very rigid, you lose the creativity. So how are you going to, how are you going to plow it back, the creativity, or creativities? You, that is what I'm saying, that it's, it's um, the rigid structures don't really help. Um, that's a challenge. That's the challenge we are faced with now. It's legendary though so that the newsroom is one of the departments you have the most problem with. True or false? Who says that? Who says so? You have the opportunity to say whether it's um, true or false. I don't believe it's the newsroom. Um, I don't believe it's the new. I, I don't have. So don't which have which room. department would you have uh, the most challenge with? Marketing. Why? Marketing because that is the end that brings the money. Yeah, and usually I give them targets which are very difficult to fulfill, you know. So, and that is, that is where I get most of my problems. How yes. crucial is the newsroom? The newsroom, uh, it depends on the format of every radio station. At this very moment, the newsroom is one of our comparative advantages, so the newsroom is very important. Well, so um, you have been running this industry along with people you call stars. And not so long ago, they say you are the personality of the year 2004. Some people think you don't deserve it. In fact, Bob G says I should tell you that you don't deserve it, but in contest, what's your answer? Maybe he deserves it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the answer. Maybe he deserves it because he is Sky. Yeah, it wasn't given to me, it was given to Sky. It's in recognition of all the things, all the good things we've done. So if he thinks I don't deserve it, then what he's saying is that Sky doesn't deserve it and he doesn't deserve it. And it seems you agree with him because in context he says you deserve it, mm -hmm. along with some people. Yeah, that is exactly what I'm saying. That it's a recognition of, um, of the results we've de delivered over years. It's a recognition of the results we've delivered over years. And, and the award was organized, sponsored by Sky Power FM, even with someone else. And then Sky, represented by you, wins it. Some don't feel comfortable about it. Fortunately, I didn't determine who wins. Yeah. If you remember, what we did was, we opened it up like we do. Yeah. The general public should write in who they think deserve to win the Personality of the Year award. Entries come in, yes? We give all the entry, the valid entries, to an independent body, and the independent body decides. The problem, uh, when we started reading some of the letters, you know, so we started opening a few, then it came to light that over sixty percent of the entry, every ten that comes, over six was naming me. Um, it became a problem. If you remember, we went into management meeting, and it was like, do we disqualify? Was Nata? Was Nata? There were a lot of arguments, and um, I bought the argument that, see, you ask people to take a decision; they've taken their decision, and because it doesn't favor you. You are rejecting it. Or you feel uncomfortable with it. Yes. I mean, if it's the people's decision, look, we serve the people. If the people see this, that is it. Yeah. And fortunately, we were not the final deciders. You understand me? So, uh, so in the end, uh, in spite of the fact that, yes, the nominations were preponderous, it was still a surprise to you that it, you it was. It was a surprise to me because what I did was, um, I believed the judges will um, the judges will consider all these conflicts and things like this, and maybe say that because it, this program was facilitated by Sky, we could excuse you know 
the chief executive. Yeah. Um, what what really amazed me was the fact that they came to a unanimous decision. All of them decided that Wasnata is the winner. And yes, Scan and is at the, the national yeah. level. Mm -hmm. They could not agree. They came out with three different people. Okay. So that should tell you um, the weight, uh, the and weight, you and know. the unanimity of it all. Yeah. Uh, was not that. So what was the future of Sky? I mean, the Sky Focus, the newspaper, the Sky TV, which people are watching right now, and Sky Radio, Sky Power FM. What next? Sky is the limit. But well, okay. Our vision but is in, to in, spe in specific terms. Yeah, the vision, the new vision is for Sky to be an excellent communication brand, and communication is wide. We are talking of telephone. We are t talking of internet. We are talking of transport, you know, it's wide, communication is wide. And, you know, we already have a license to operate a telephone company and How? an internet company, IMMDS license. Which is the same TV the license? The TV license. Which, if we introduce a small box, you can access, um, if you made a right investment, you can access telephone and access internet. With a small keyboard plugged to your, what you use your TV as, the computer screen and access the internet. High speed. So Sky is going to be changing in the future? We will, if see, we move, most of the decisions you take now, you take it looking at the opportunities around you. And time is very funny. Time can make some of your decisions look uh, wrong. Yeah. Times you take decisions today, tomorrow, new technology, a lot of things happen and you realize that it's not the best decision. You understand me? For now, that is the vision. Yeah, that's the vision, but we keep, we will always be... Reviewing. And competition in the future? Competition? I don't, you know, I, I've never been bothered by competition. Why? Because, um, I believe that no one um, brand, one company can s satisfy, you know, the, the masses of people we have. There's always a niche market for somebody who is smart. But as to that niche market be being um, commercially viable, it's another thing. There's always room for somebody to come in. But when you come in, as to you, um, making enough money to sustain you, to keep you going. Is another what thing? are you going to do in the future? Are you always going to be chief executive of Sky no, no. Or of Sky no. Group? We will, we will definitely go public very, very soon. Actually. Yeah, so, so why would you want to go public? We have grown, you know, um, staff who are capable of running this company and maybe doing it even better than I'm going about it now. So it will be it will be very interesting to get to the board level and get you guys to do your own thing, and then we see how it goes. Okay. Um, just before we wind up, um, there's word at some places that, given the way you are growing, your phenomenal success, you have an eye on politics. Perhaps you want to be an MP someday. You know better than that. No, I believe we all have roles we can play. Um, to develop this nation. You don't have the heart for politics? At all. I don't want any political position. At all. I want to be um, an ordinary person, you know, and pushing. Okay. An ordinary Wilson Arthur. But come to think of it, he's the chief executive of Sky Group of Companies. But looking back, he was also born in a village. Ateku started the early primary school there went on and on and on and uh, well he's us you've seen him thank you very much for viewing for watching and bye-bye for now